Come for the bread, stay for the politics. I'm Ben Walsh, and this is Let Them Eat Bread. So today on Let Them Eat Bread, we have an interesting recipe uh, coming from Chef Stephen Walsh. And if you've been paying attention to this series, um, you know that he and I share a last name, and that is no coincidence. He is my little brother who is sharing his potato, red, his potato bread recipe with me to try. And although Stephen will not be with me on the show today um, to show me how to do it, uh, I have promised him that if I royally mess this up, uh, that he can come on the show and show me how to do it the right way. So that being said, let's get started. So first, we have four ounces of water here at room temperature. And we're going to combine that with our yeast. We have half an ounce of yeast here. This is active dry yeast. Now, so quick correction, on the recipe, it did say um, one and a quarter ounces of fresh yeast. However... Uh, we're going to be using active dry yeast, so we are going to be using um, that amount instead, uh, the half an ounce instead. We're also going to put our sugar here. Let's just make sure this is sugar and not salt. Yes, it is. All right, we're going to put our sugar in here as well. We're going to give this a quick mix with our whisk, fork if you have it. And just again, you're not trying to get this all to come together, but you do just want to give it just a quick mix, okay? Then we're going to cover this and set this aside while we prepare the rest of our ingredients. So the next thing we need to do is combine our eggs and our milk. I have 10 ounces of almond milk here, but any milk will do just fine. Again, we've got two large eggs. We're just going to pour these in here to combine. Okay. Just give these a quick mix, make sure everything is mixed together. All righty. Yeah, so you see I've got a little bit of egg on the end here, so just I just need to whisk a little bit more. And then we will see that I am actually do not have, hopefully, as much or any egg hanging off my whisk. All right. We are probably done with the whisk, but I am gonna keep it here just in case. So this is our egg and milk mixture. Next thing we need to do is combine our two flours. Today we're working with uh, both all-purpose flour and bread flour. We have four ounces of bread flour and we have uh, one and a half pounds or uh, 24 ounces of bread uh, uh, all-purpose flour. We're just going to mix these together. We're also going to mix in our salt. We have three quarters of an ounce of salt. I'm using kosher salt. You can see it's like a decent clip of salt, um, but don't worry, the potatoes are going to absorb a lot of that. So if it looks a little, if it seems a little salty to you, don't worry about that. Do just follow the recipe uh, and I believe we'll be fine. The other thing generally about salt is, and we're just going to mix these here, by the way. Um, the other thing generally about salt is that if you feel there's too much or too little, you can typically alter the salt. What it's really going to do is enhance the flavor of the bread. It doesn't really act to do much chemically um, with the bread recipe. But, um, you know, I would, I would at least do at least a tablespoon of salt if you're working with the bread or even a large bread recipe like this is. Um, at least a tablespoon, maybe two. Okay. All right, so now we are we have combined our flours. We have our potatoes here. We're going to mix in. Oops, that's not our potatoes. Sorry, that's the yeast mixture. We have our potatoes here. Okay, and so these are um, mashed potatoes I made last night. They're cooled to room temperature. I just mashed them with a fork. Just boiled the potatoes. You can bake them. You can boil them. It should not matter too much for this recipe. The only thing it might do is you might waterlog the potatoes a little bit. By, bake, by boiling them as opposed to baking them. If you do that and you haven't let them cool to room temperature and it seems like your potatoes might have a little bit of water in them, don't worry about it. Uh, like with all doughs, it's gonna be easier for us to dry a wet dough than to re-wet a dry dough. So we're just gonna put this in and together and we will mix it up. And if it turns out it's a little liquidy, this dough, then we'll just add a little bit more flour as we're getting in and we will correct that error. 
Okay, so now that I've talked enough about that, we are going to actually combine our potatoes in here. Oh, here we go. That was, that was a little bit more of a splash than I intended, but that's okay. All right. So we are going to... All right. So we have added our potatoes. Now we're going to add our milk mixture. and our yeast mixture. And we're just gonna combine this a little bit right before we add our flour. And now ordinarily, uh, once all this is combined, you would put this out onto a, um, a what's it called, a board like we normally do on the show, but because um, it is cold in the Northern Hemisphere where I am, um, and because it is, uh, the dough requires a warm temperature to knead, and I don't really wanna sit here kneading for a while, and I'm sure you don't wanna watch me knead for a while. Um, what we're gonna do instead is I have brought my standing mixer out, and we're going to use that um, instead to kind of get this all combined. I'm just gonna do a base combine in here, put in the butter, it's four ounces of butter here melted. Uh, it's one stick in the US. And we're just gonna combine this roughly until dough forms. Um, so I'm using a whisk for this. It probably isn't the best tool. Uh, I'll probably have to switch from the whisk to something else, probably to my spatula here in a moment. But for now, right, this is kind of what we're working with. The potatoes need to be baked with the skins on for this recipe. So if you peeled your potatoes, not that big a deal, but the recipe does call for the skins on. All right, so I'm gonna just try and clear my whisk here of all of the, um, of all the dough. And then we will put the whisk down and we'll just start kneading this. We'll combine it to the, we'll put all of it in the standing mixer. If you're not using a standing mixer, that's fine. Just mix it with your hands or a wooden spoon. And we will be on our way. This will just take a moment. I regret doing this this way a little bit, but that's okay. We live and we learn, right? We are doing this together for this very purpose. And also, um, another way that this recipe has been made for me, although I've never made it this way, is to, instead of mashing the potatoes, do the potatoes um, in chunks. And um, to kind of have chunks of potatoes. Uh, those are typically warmer um, when you put them in. So if you do decide to do that, just know that, you know, this whole process is going to be a little different because you're working with chunks of potato as opposed to mashed of potato. And it, it's, just a little, it's just a little different. It'll feel different. Um, it'll act differently, um, and it will be recommended that you put the potatoes in like at the very end um, so that you don't dry out the dough with the potatoes. All right, this is probably as much as I'm going to get off. Uh, I think I can get a little bit more off. There we go. Sorry about this. Okay. That's that's probably as good as it's going to be. All right, so what we're going to do now, <clears throat> excuse me, so we're going to put everything in our standing mixer bowl. It should feel very heavy. Come on, don't fail me now. And that should just boop right in that goes. Yeah, so just make sure you get all your ingredients in here. And it is not looking like we're going to have a waterlogged dough, which is great. We'll just kind of make all that easier as we go forward. And if your dough seems a little bit dry, there's no harm in putting a little bit extra water in. As you saw on my episode last week with Lauren Ashcraft, um, sometimes a recipe just doesn't anticipate how your ingredients are going to react. Uh, which is fine because, you know, lots of things contribute to how well a dough hydrates. Um, 
the amount of water in the air, for example, your elevation can do it. There are lots of factors um, that change the way that a dough behaves. So if your dough is a little dry or a little wet, um, you know, there are little things that you can do before it comes together. And I emphasize before it comes together um, to help fix it. Once it's in a dough ball and it's kind of been worked a little, it's going to be a lot harder to kind of make any corrections that you need to make. But um, if you monitor it, you can correct almost any error that you have, as long as with, you know, with wet ingredients and dry ingredients. And again, water and flour. I wouldn't go adding oils and things to breads because that will alter the chemistry of it a little bit. All right, so I'm going to chuck this. Oh, it's one little piece of dough left. Come on, in you go. There you go. So I chuck this in the sink. Actually, probably put everything in the sink at this point. Uh, let's, let's get that drop of extra liquid. Okay. And then just this. All right. All right, so we're going to move over to the standing mixer. I have affixed a dough hook to it, and we're just going to turn it on the lowest setting for a little bit. Let's just bring some of this excess flour in. We will need to eventually turn it onto our board, but for now, also take a moment to clean up if you need to. Um, you're going to listen for your standing mixer to make a straining sound. So you can hear that it's straining a little bit. So once you do that, just turn the speed up a little um, to the next one. You don't want to turn the speed up too much at any given time uh, because that may over need your dough. Remember, like I always say, if you're using a standing mixer, just be aware that you can over need your dough. You can overwork your dough. So just be careful. What we're looking for with this particular dough is to knead it, not until necessarily it passes the window pane test, but it's until it's between 88 and 90 degrees. So I'm actually going to be using um, my trusty thermometer to do this. But if not, if you don't have a thermometer, um, the best thing to do is just to um, put your hand in the dough and if it, it feels just lukewarm, that's probably close to where you want it to be. You can make it a little warmer than that, but you don't need to worry too much once it's at that stage. Also, if your dough just kind of looks like it's not being worked a particular amount, you can turn up the speed. But honestly, unless the, the machine is actually straining all by itself, there's really no need to do that. If the dough seems too wet, obviously add some add a little bit of flour. But again, we're adding little bits of ingredients at a time. If it's too dry, take it, turn your stand mixer off, add a tiny bit of liquid, and then turn your stand mixer on, on the lowest setting, right? If you need to bring a, a dough back essentially from the dead, that's the way you can do it. But you know, we're in the stage where we're forming it into a dough ball, so it's much more difficult to, um, you know, save it at this point if it's too dry. So, the dough's starting to look like dough. It's good. Uh, it probably needs more time, but uh, and it probably needs a little bit more flour. So, what we're going to do is we're going to take a tiny bit of all-purpose flour, literally just a couple fingers full, and we're going to add it, because think about it this way, right? For a standing mixer, um, you're not kneading it on a board, so you're not going to have the benefit of adding flour to a board and knowing when it sticks. So we're just going to add a tiny little bit of flour to our machine, and really this is not much. You def I would say if you're measuring it, an eighth of a cup is probably good, and we're going to turn it right back on onto that low setting and let it deal um, with the flour intake. And then once it started to incorporate that, you can bring it back up to speed. Again, be careful about overworking your dough. You know, you, it is possible to, to do that, and then it won't rise evenly. It won't rise well. Um, so remember, we're looking for a ball of dough to form. Um, tacky, not sticky, right? You want to be able to put your hand on it and then take your hand off, even after sitting on the dough for a while. And just know that <clears throat> when you do that, pieces of the dough are not going to actually stick to your hand, right? So that's really the goal here. So I'm gonna show you again. So we've got some more 
development here, but the flour didn't really seem to do much, and the dough still looks pretty pretty wet. Um, you can see that it's kind of falling off the uh, you can see that it's falling off the hook here. So what we want to do is we want to add a little bit more flour for this to come together in a cohesive manner. In fact, you can actually see as I'm talking here that it's it's coming off the hook um, that it's dragging down. So we're going to add probably about that same amount. And remember, you're doing this as if you were flouring a board, right? So think about how much flour you'd put on a board to knead around. And that's how much flour you want to add to your machine. All right, so we're going to try this again. And by the way, I would be doing the same thing if I was kneading on a board, right? The only difference is the board is cold, the house is cold. So we're just trying to keep every all the heat and warmth in a, um, in a smaller environment here to make sure that you know, we keep our bread at the right temperature. Um, the other thing you can do if you want the bread to increase in temperature, obviously, if you're using a board that isn't stone, it might not, uh, you know, it might not be as cool. If you are using a stone board, you can heat it um, by just kind of wiping it down with hot water. Um, you know, you can warm your house a little bit. You can turn your oven on to kind of get some heat moving in your kitchen, right? There are ways you can also you can just knead faster. That's another thing, right? The more you work it, the hotter the dough is going to get, partially because it's taking the heat from your hands, but partially because the working of the dough and the moving it around the friction actually creates warmth in the bread, and that'll bring it to the temperature we want it to be at, so... All right, so our bread is gonna need even more flour and that's okay. So just stop your machine or stop your kneading, put some more flour on and get going. I'm actually gonna add close to a quarter cup of flour now because clearly this is a very wet dough. And although it's getting more difficult to lift this, you can see that the dough is, star is starting to fall down. Um, it's a little difficult to see from there, but if you stare at it a while, you'll see that the dough is actually moving down. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna add about a quarter cup of flour here. Just going to add it directly in. Try and spread it out if you can, but there's really no pressure to do that. Because we want this to become a nice ball of dough. And we're just going to close it and do it again. If you're doing this by hand, obviously you are way ahead of me on this game, right? You just, you're adding it as you're going. You're feeling it out. And we've done enough bread together at this point that you should know. You should have a feel for kind of when it's good. Um, so it's different, obviously, when you're using machine because you have to check it each time. But when you're doing it with your hands, you can feel it. You can um, you can feel that it's getting less tacky, you can, uh, less sticky. You can feel that it's coming together. Uh, that type of thing you just can't get if you're working um, with a machine. And apparently, in that time, um, the dough, the flour exploded everywhere. So that's fine. I will clean that up later. So by the way, if your flour goes all over the place, like it just did for me, it probably means you put too much in. So that's another thing to be aware of or that your mixer is spinning too quickly. Okay. So I'm going to lift this up because we've got, look, this is, this is pretty much a cohesive mass at this point. So I'm going to put some flour on my hands and I'm just going to, and I'm going to take this off and then we'll just put it on here to just kind of get it into a ball because this is coming together. All right, we'll just take that down. And by the way, flowering of your hands, all that really does is just help so that things don't stick as much. Um, but I would actually say that this is not done. Uh, it's still sticky. So as I touch it, you can see that my hands still have dough on them. Um, so you don't want that. So we're going to add some flour, but we're going to be strategic about where we place our flour this time. We're going to place it underneath the bread so that the machine does not spread the flour all over the floor. And that should help us um, with bringing this together. Okay, so I'm gonna rinse my hands real quick just cause they're covered in dough. But um, if you are using machine and you did not get your hands covered in dough, then just add a little bit of flour to the bottom, 
push that bread on to push the dough on top of it that will make sure that there's a barrier so that you don't have um you know so you don't have uh, as much flour spillage as i just had But it's okay if your flour went everywhere. Bread is a messy process, it just is. So we deal. So I have a space behind my bread that I'm gonna pour some more flour into. And then I'm gonna take some flour on my hands and I'm gonna push the bread down on top of that flour so that the machine does not spread the flour everywhere. seem to be working as well as I thought it would. That's all right. So the other thing you can do is just move the flour in the bowl with your hands a little bit if the machine's really not doing a good job of it, which is fine too. But actually, I think this is about to come together. So we're going to run this real quickly, and then I think we will actually be ready to divide this up and let it rise. I think that is probably where we are heading, and that's a good thing. And it has taken less time than it usually does. So that is a benefit as well. So we're just going to work that in here a little bit using floured hands so, it doesn't, so the dough doesn't stick as much. Um, and you'll feel it. It's starting to come together. It's starting to come together, I mean. And that's honestly the best thing for it. All right. So I'm just turning my machine up for one last minute here just to make sure everything has come together. All the flour that I put in just now has been absorbed and it is kneading it pretty intensely, which is great. It's exactly what we want. And so you want to just keep watching it and make sure that it looks right. And then as soon as it looks proper, just stop it, take it out, and you'll see that it's ready for us to bring back to our board. And sometimes it just gets stuck on your machine, so no big deal. Oh, and sometimes your machine gets stuck. There we go. So you can see we've got a nice cohesive dough formed in here. It's still a little sticky, so I'm, I'm going to move it just around a little bit. Um, but it, it's much less sticky, right? So I'm going to put my hand on it and just show you. So I'm putting my hand on, and it sticks a little, right? You can see dough is sticking a little, but not nearly as much. So we're going to take a little bit of flour and just put it on here to kind of seal the deal and finish this off. And then we're just going to take our hands, our nice floured hands, and just work it out of the bowl. And there you go. There's our dough ball. And, you know, just use your hands or a spatula. Just get the rest of this out. This is dough. You've worked hard for this. You should keep it as much as you can. It'll also, you know, obviously it's bread, so pre-bread, I guess. And there you go. So now we have our, we have our, um, our mass of dough. I'm just going to give it a quick few needs to incorporate this flour and to kind of get it into a ball form, but this is perfect. So so we're gonna stick our thermometer in it and see. All 
All right, so we're in the high 70s. Um, so it does need a little bit more time. Now, partially it might be because it's on um, a cold board, but just in case, I am just gonna give it a little bit more time so it at least gets to 80 because that's really the minimum it should be as we're doing this. And if this needs lots more flour, then that's fine. Just give that to it. But you can see if I put my hand on it, nothing. It's, it's tacky. So when I put my hand on it, you know, it doesn't just bounce off, but um, At the same time, it's not sticking to my fingers anymore. The dough come, come, came right off my fingers into this dough, which is great. And just keep working it until it feels right. And put your hand in and make sure it's that lukewarm you want. All right, let's try it. All right, and we are at 80 degrees, perfect. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna turn this into a ball. Just the same way we always do, take our hands, cup them around the outside, make it into a ball here till it gets nice and taut and tight on top. You'll start to see if you look down um, that it's tightening up. Perfect, and just put a finger on it and it bounces back. We are ready to start rising. So what we're going to do is we are going to take our rising bowl and um, I am going to put a little bit of oil in it. I like the idea of using olive oil. You remember you want just barely a teaspoon in here. It's really not much at all just enough to coat the bowl and bread. So take your fingers and rub that around the bowl. And then as soon as it is ready, you're gonna put your dough ball in, toss it around with the oil, and then we are gonna get ready to talk some politics, some privacy and some climate change. We are big heavy hitters today with COP26 coming up and a bunch of new uh, and old privacy issues <clears throat> that I think are important. None of this is particularly socialist, um, but you know, socialism also deals primarily with uh, more democracy, right? Bringing the power back into the hands of the people as opposed to um, the power of the very few. So when we talk about how companies abuse people and how individuals are kind of dealing with what companies can do them, what power and, and rights that you have over corporations, this is an important thing for socialists to think about too, and that's why I think these issues are important for us to talk about uh, on this show. So, cover this one plastic wrap, put a tea towel on top of it, we'll set our timer for an hour, uh, and then we'll talk some politics. I'll be right back. Again, if you have something more sustainable than plastic wrap, always use it. I want as much as possible to uh, talk about sustainability on the show, especially since we're talking about climate change today and plastic is a big part of that. Um, so if you have reusable plastic wrap um, or something similar, obviously you should use that. As I typically say, don't use a lid. The lid will pop off, especially since we got such a large dough today. You will likely pop your lid right off. And then an extra tea towel just to keep things nice and toasty. All right, our timer is set. So if you are not staying for the politics portion, take care, I'll see you in an hour. If you are staying for the politics portion, we're about to get started. One quick note though, before you non-politickers leave, this is gonna have to sit for an additional 10 minutes on our table. So when the timer actually goes off, the hour timer, we're going to put it on the board, divide real quick. Just gonna take a quick break from 
uh, politicking. We're going to divide, put these um, to rest on the table for 10 minutes each. And then once we do that, we will continue talking politics just to cover that 10 minutes. And then we'll go on with the instructions. I'll give you some baking instructions. We'll move on from there. All right. So with that being said, set your timers. I will see you in about an hour and 10 minutes. Oh, uh, about an hour and then again in 10 minutes. And let's see what's on the whiteboard this week, shall we? So, it's a lot here. Um, I want to talk, I, so let's let's start with privacy and we'll, we'll go to climate change because climate change stuff's probably going to take a while. So, uh, Clearview AI, probably not a company that you are particularly well versed with. So let me give you some background. So Clearview AI is a company that scrapes facial data and other biometric data from the internet. Um, they go through uh, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all kinds of social media to get people's faces. And they use this to assist law enforcement in the, identify, in the identifying of individuals um, from cameras and things like that. And so recently, there's been a bit of a kerfuffle with um, Clearview AI because of the way that they were handling um, watchdogs. So Clearview AI was sued a number of times by another by a number of small nonprofits who um, are trying to watch out for regular people like you and me, and to make sure that our data is not being used for a purpose that is unlawful, unfair, that takes advantage of us, or that uses our data without our explicit consent. By the way, data scraping, data mining, these kinds of things, they do tend to have the effect of taking our data without our permission and then using that data without our permission either to make money or for surveillance purposes and things like that. For those of you who have been around for a while and are aware of what the NSA does, thanks to the Edward Snowden leaks, you kind of, you know, you could you, your alarm bells are probably starting to ring with this kind of stuff, right? Blanket covering of all of your personal information from online and using that in criminal probes and surveillance without our permission is clear violation of the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So obviously these groups were kind of were concerned about this and were suing Clearview AI. Now Clearview AI did not want to go forward with these lawsuits. So one of the things that Clearview is doing, and by the way, this is a large, uh, this is a, a well-known corporate tactic for kind of getting out of jail free with some of these smaller organizations that sue them is to do what's called lawfare or corporate lawfare. So essentially what this means is a corporation will use the fact that it has lots of resources in order to bog down the court proceedings and to keep these small organizations filing additional paperwork and you know having motions and other types of legal maneuvers, all of which cost money, right? So if you're not a lawyer, you might not know, but anytime you have to file something with the court or answer something that has been filed against you, all of that costs money. And sometimes it's not very expensive, but sometimes it's very expensive. It all depends on how many resources of the court that it's going to use for, you know, the court to figure out, you know, whatever it is that's being done here. Now, for a corporation who makes billions of dollars every year, like Clearview, these couple hundred dollars here, couple hundred dollars there, plus paying the lawyers, this doesn't cost them much money. And for them, it's kind of a cost of doing business. This, these kinds of expenses are more or less factored into the general idea of the business that is being conducted in general, right? It goes into the budget, hey, we're going to spend this much on, on legal fees and things this quarter or whatever. And so for large corporations, this is a drop in the bucket. It does not matter to them. However, for these small watchdog organizations, what it can do is it tends to bankrupt them because they are typically enforcing a, a niche right or under a privacy law or um, there are other circumstances where this exists too, but essentially, oh, so journalistic organizations, right, will sue if will sue a governmental organization or a large corporation if it's found out something, right? And because these nonprofits do not have as much money as either the government or large corporations, oftentimes what goes on in these situations is that instead of actually facing the merits of the lawsuit and actually addressing whether the thing that the corporation or government is accused of is actually true, what they will do instead is to just bog down the proceedings so that eventually the small organization or the group of people or the individual who is filing the suit just runs out of money and has to withdraw from the suit or just get the case dismissed 
because they cannot answer any longer the massive amount of pleadings that the corporation or government has pushed against them. And this, this practice of using your resources to force the court to charge you more fees and to charge you more legal fees, uh, for, sorry, to force you to incur more legal fees is called lawfare. Now in the, in this, in the way that this is done in corporations, right? It's called corporate lawfare, done government, government lawfare. Essentially, this is a, a tried and true method, unfortunately, for depriving watchdog organizations of their ability to actually protect the people that they claim to protect. Now, the so Clearview is in violation of a law called BIPA. It is Illinois' um, data protection law, biometric data protection law. And this law is actually really important because what it does in a way that many laws do not is says that your fingerprint, your voice, um, your face shape, and anything else on your body that could be on your body or part of you that could be used as a biometric identifier, such as a retina scan, all of that belongs to you. You own it. And if someone else wants to use it, they have to get your permission first. So obviously you can see that there's a conflict here between what Clearview is doing by scraping massive amounts of data from social media and what this law protects against, which is essentially the large scale scraping and non-consensual use of biometric information, including faces. So you see where the problem has arisen. So many of these organizations um, who help to enforce the BIPA by their private rights of action, which is just say under the law, they're allowed to sue a big baddie if they're breaking the law, um, right? So a bunch of these organizations filed suit against Clearview and Clearview said, well, I actually, well, they didn't say this, but essentially the idea is, hey, I know I'm guilty. I know that I'm doing the thing that is against the law, but if I just push so hard in the court paperwork and I use things called subpoenas, um, which are essentially a, a court order that allows you to gather evidence. Also, they're very costly. Um, I can just drive these organizations into bankruptcy, or I can force them to abandon these lawsuits out of fear of bankruptcy. And this is what Clearview was doing. Now, this news blew up in the privacy world. And for those of you who have not been following the show, I'm a privacy professional as well as a lawyer. And I had seen this issue, and I thought this was an in interesting topic to talk about because it doesn't just apply to privacy. It applies to um, a whole variety of things. So for example, if you can, so imagine, uh, so for those of you who have been kind of following Lefty News for a while, you probably remember the Dakota Access Pipeline, right? Uh, line three is another pipeline battle that's going on, Keystone XL, right? All of these pipelines are being built through, oftentimes through indigenous people's land, um, but usually through waterways and streams. And obviously there are concerns that there will be a leak into the waterways and it will destroy indigenous lands or it will destroy um, the drinking water for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So oftentimes the only way to stop a company from doing this is to sue them, right? So you go to court, you say to the government, hey, this organization is doing this thing, which is bad. It violates these laws. It violates our sovereignty in the case of Native Americans. <clears throat> it violates my property rights in the case of individual landowners. Or, you know, it, it violates like an EPA water rule or something like that, right? That you, you typically find a ground on which you can sue. And because it's individuals, nonprofits, and um, indigenous tribes who are suing, they don't have a ton of money to put behind these lawsuits. So oil and gas companies have realized, well, if we just use lawfare, we don't actually have to fight on the merits. We can just push them and push them and push them and push them until eventually they don't have enough money to continue fighting us. And unfortunately, this is what has tended to happen. So we're seeing this kind of come out again in Clearview AI. And there is, obviously, when this news came out, there was a lot of backlash. People have kind of seen this show before, right? We know that what lawfare looks like. Um, we know that it's an unfair tactic. And we know, honestly, that in some ways, it's an admission of guilt. It essentially says, we are too afraid to counter this on the merits. So we're going to use underhanded tactics to push our adversaries out of court. Because think about it this way, right? If you're an organization and you're not doing anything wrong, and you really do believe that you're not doing anything wrong, and you have nothing to hide, why wouldn't you just go through with the case? It would be a quick case. You would prove that everything you were doing was on the up and up. 
and then you'd move on and it wouldn't matter anymore, right? But when you take these actions, essentially you're saying we either do not want to or we are afraid to fight this on the merits, which means either we are guilty or we're afraid of what people might find out even if we're not guilty. And you take that to its logical conclusion, which is we have to do literally anything we can to stop people from finding out about us. And so you engage in lawfare. But if you, there was nothing to, you know, if there was nothing to find, then obviously in the scope of the lawsuit, then you would just, you know, you would fight it. It would be done very quickly and you'd move on. So you can see that this is an obvious problem. Now, luckily, there was a bit of good news here because uh, due to the incredible amount of backlash um, from uh, privacy organizations, um, activists on the ground, and, and other individuals who were concerned about this, uh, I believe even some legislators in um, Illinois wrote uh, amicus curiae, which is the Latin term for friend of the court. It's essentially a, a brief, which is a, a, a long document kind of stating your opinion on how the case should go. And many of these were sent to the court. I believe that some legislators in Illinois actually also sent these documents to the court to say, hey, you know, this is bad. The, you know, the way that this is being carried out is not really fair. And because of the crazy amount of backlash that this generated, luckily, Clearview decided to to stop playing this game. So they have they have called back their subpoenas. They have told the court they're no longer interested in filing all of these motions and things. And so it looks like we may actually get some justice here, and this case may actually proceed to be fought on its merits. Now, it will be interesting, just from the privacy side, to see actually what the court decides. But for the most part, from my earlier commentary, you get a sense that Clearview is definitely guilty, and it just is a matter of time before they have to stop doing what they're doing, at least in Illinois, or to people who are from Illinois, right? Now, if other states pass biometric uh, data protection laws, then you know, you can get the same basic thing. And by the way, this should be a lesson to people who are activists on the ground who are thinking about privacy in the sense of themselves, but also um, other people. And regardless of what kind of work you're doing, right, you don't necessarily want to be surveilled by the government. You don't want to be surveilled by a corporation without your consent. So fighting for these types of privacy laws is actually really useful for many causes, because it allows you to retain some level of anonymity if you need it, um, but it also just protects you from being tracked wherever you go. And there's really, it's weird to be tracked wherever you go, right? So it's, I mean, and often we are because of our cell phones or, or what have you, but you know, it's it's different when, when the government is receiving all this data, uh, especially policing forces who have known to not exactly be uh, a friend of people who are trying to change the world, right? So. Luckily, in this case, Clearview was called out. They had their uh, their lawfare uncovered and exposed, uh, and in it, out of embarrassment um, or out of PR or whatever it was, they decided that they were going to pull back on this corporate lawfare. And so the activists who are suing them are going to get to go forward with their case, which is great. Um, I think other states should pass these types of laws because corporations like Clearview, they really shouldn't exist. This kind of large-scale scraping, like... If we value privacy at all in this country, or anywhere actually, we need to have laws that protect us against this, right? You should not, if you're not doing anything wrong, no one should be submitting your face and putting your face in a police or government database, right? There's no reason for it. That level of surveillance is just unnecessary. It chills speech and action, right? You may choose to say fewer things. You may choose to do fewer things if you're being surveilled all the time. Even if what you're planning on saying and doing isn't necessarily wrong or bad or evil or criminal, you just may feel concerned about what someone else will perceive as bad, so it may chill your actions, right? It's um, a suppressing tactic for activists and things like that. So anyway, moral of the story, um, there is some good news in this case, but I did want to educate you guys about corporate lawfare so that when you see it, you can identify it and you can bring the appropriate level of backlash because as long as we can call this out and make and shame the company into reversing course on this front, you know, we may actually be able to get to a situation where these small organizations that are looking out for our privacy rights um, or our water rights or our land rights or whatever can actually go forward with the cases 
that they are trying to go forward with and hold these corporations accountable instead of losing the money war. Excuse me. So the next issue I want to talk about is, it's really old. This was a story a long time ago, but it's still really important because it's important in the sense that the technology is out there, not necessarily that it's important for this particular story or this particular thing that came up weeks and weeks ago that most people aren't really thinking about anymore. It's still an issue in the world and we should continue to have it somewhat in the forefront of our minds concerning our privacy, um, and our right to be our right against being surveilled. Okay, so many weeks ago, I think it's probably two, three months now. Um, there was a revelation about um, an organization called the NSO Group, and the NSO Group is an, an Israel-based intelligence service that creates a software called Pegasus. And Pegasus essentially is a software that takes over someone's phone and transmits lots of information to whoever it is who's requested it. Now, the thing that is very scary about Pegasus in particular is that you actually don't need to click on anything for Pegasus to infect your phone. Someone simply just needs to send you something with Pegasus in it and will take over your entire phone. So usually the way these types of things work is, and I'm sure you've heard what phishing is, but if you haven't, just let me explain briefly. So essentially someone sends you a, fish, a, a suspicious looking email with a link in it or an attachment to open or something like that. And it, it just kind of looks wrong, but oftentimes these have things like um, urgent timelines or they're supposedly from people who you should trust. So you'll see some from UPS, you'll see some from the post office, you'll see some supposedly from governments, you'll see some from political candidates, you'll see some from like, so in the corporate sense, you'll see them from like your CEO or, or, or HR generally or whatever. So these messages are meant to confuse you and they're meant to confuse you and trick you into opening either a link or an attachment. And what this does is your clicking on that allows the hacker to get into your computer or phone or what have you and take it over. This is usually how phishing works. And essentially they're after information of yours, but they just are trying to trick you to give it to them or to give some version of it to them or give them the access to find it on their own. Okay. And this data is then resold in the black market. And that's how this is a profitable venture. Okay. So just, if you don't know what, if you didn't know what phishing was, that's what phishing is, generally speaking. Now, the thing that it makes NSO Pegasus, NSO Group's Pegasus software much more dangerous than that is because the Pegasus software itself does not actually require you to do anything. As long as someone sends it to your phone, that's it. Game over. Your whole phone is compromised. It can, it, list, it can listen to everything you're saying. It can take pictures of you without your permission. If, so for example, if you're looking at your phone and you're scrolling and you have a front facing camera, just for example, right? It can snap a picture of you and send that out of your phone without you ever knowing, okay? It can see every keystroke you do. So all your passwords gone, forget about it. It can read your screen. Say you open your banking app, it knows everything about your banking app. If you look at your routing number or your account number for some reason, it can take screenshots and send it to someone else. It can, it can track everyone you call, everyone you text, the contents of those calls and text messages, it can track your voicemails, everything. Everything that your phone does, it has access to and can send to someone else. Now, this is obviously very scary all by itself. To make matters worse, when Pegasus and NSO, um, when Pegasus, when NSO groups Pegasus, was revealed to the world stage as being problematic, one of the things that was particularly problematic was is that governments were using this to spy on other governments. It was also being used to um, spy on journalists. Famously, or perhaps infamously, Jamal Khashoggi's phone was infected with Pegasus very shortly before he was um, assassinated in the Turkish embassy uh, by Saudi butchers, okay? So you get a sense of how worrying this can be because essentially the, 
Someone can know everything about you. They can use it to trace you. And in the case of Jamal Khashoggi, it can be used to kill you. So obviously this is very dangerous. And it turned out that many governments were surveilling each other as well. So there was a large leak of, inform of classified information from the NSO group showing that different countries were spying on the personal cell phones of different leaders around the world. And you might not care about that because, you know, screw them or whatever and leaders, whatever. But the thing is, it was also being used to track journalists. Al Jazeera, I believe, reported that many of their journalists were being tracked using uh, Pegasus software. Um, Jamal Khashoggi, I mentioned already. But journalists from around the world are being targeted by this without even knowing. So this is obviously very dangerous. Now, some people might say, hey, the solution is to use encrypted messaging apps and things like that in order to send your messages. That's where you're wrong, kiddo, because the Pegasus software it doesn't need to break into your app. As soon as you open that app on your screen, it can take a screenshot of everything. It sees what you see. It's not worried about coming through the network and hacking into your phone necessarily in the way that it might try to do if it was trying to interpret an encrypted message being sent from your phone. That's not the point. It is on your phone. It's just sending the stuff that your phone can see. And by the way, it can do all this when your phone is, um, is in its lock screen or the screen is turned off. Now, I don't actually know for sure if it has any power over your phone, if your phone is turned, as it has the power turned off. I, don't, I would imagine it probably doesn't, but who knows? I mean, if your phone, um, instead of actually turning off off, uses some level of hibernation or some level of, of low level battery life to allow you to turn it on at a moment's notice or to give you I don't know, a little screen or something that shows you're charging or whatever, if it uses some amount of power, then Pegasus might be able to use your phone even when it's turned off. So that part I don't know. It's pure speculation. But regardless, you can see where this is very problematic. And this is problematic for journalists. It's problematic for activists because essentially what's happening now is without your consent, illegally, without you having to do anything, Anyone who has your content information of any way, shape, or form that you can open on your phone can infect your phone without you doing anything. And truthfully, so I have a lot to say about this after I've already said a lot about this. Um, first and foremost, uh, NSO should be shut down. Pegasus shouldn't exist, right? This type of ability to spy on people without their consent, like we talked about in the Clearview story just a moment ago, is completely ridiculous. It chills speech, it chills behavior. And honestly, this is a giant fishing expedition because if you're not doing anything wrong, in theory, you're fine. But the problem is if you slip up even once, your phone is likely on you, right? So the second you do something that is um, risque or scandalous or outside the norm, um, so say, for example, you have a strange kink or a kink that is not shared, a sexual uh, desire or pleasure or whatever that's not shared by large portions of the population. It's just whatever it has to be, use your imagination, okay? So what if, you, you know, you're doing that and your phone is on you and, or your phone is, is somewhere and the audio of this sex act or, or video even worse is, is taken um, of you doing this or your messages talking about doing this with someone else um, are leaked to the public, right? It could change your whole life. It could make you unemployable. It could make you um, a pariah, right? Especially if you're in public life. So just, and this, that's kind of an extreme example, but um, there are lots of ways where this can be really problematic. So honestly, the best thing to do with it is to get rid of it. It's the same argument that um, non-proliferation activists make, which is we shouldn't have nuclear weapons because one nuke, you know, it, it allows for other nukes to come up uh, and, and, and always keeps the pressure there that a nuke will eventually be used. This is more or less the same thing. You should think of, of Pegasus as a surveillance nuke. Now that one country, and by the way, we kind of saw that being true, right? Once one country was able to buy it, other countries were able to buy it and they were able to use it on whoever they wanted. So now is the argument to say, well, everyone should have Pegasus and everyone should be able to spy on everyone. 
as long as they have some way to get a touch of them? And the answer is obviously no, you should not do that. Not only is that incredibly dangerous, um, but it just, if we value each other at all as individuals and recognize that we have private lives, this is a total infringement on that concept of ourselves. This is about, this is partially about our personhood, right? What makes us who we are is partially made up of the things that we do when no one's looking. And by the way, we should be allowed to do things when no one is looking. There should not be a constant threat that anything we do, anytime we do it, is being surveilled by someone else. Now, for those in the American context, they might say, well, my phone pretty much tracks everything I do anyway. Fair enough. But this is different because that you can get around, right? You can turn, you can disable some of these services. You can, you know, you can log off Facebook for the last time. You can quit Instagram. You can quit TikTok. You can, you know, turn your data off and your Wi-Fi off and Wi-Fi off and just use your phone for calling, right? There are ways you can get around some of this. You can only use encrypted messaging apps on your computer as opposed to on your phone, right? There are some ways that you can get around what's going on here. But with Pegasus, you lose that ability because essentially your phone is no longer your own. And anything you do while your phone is on you, near you, or what have you, is just totally gone. And okay, so maybe the solution is a burner phone. Okay, good thought. But even a burner phone can get Pegasus on it because Pegasus does not require you to have any particular hardware or software to use it. It just takes over the whole phone. So anything that you do with that phone can be tracked. So you see where this is obviously um, essentially endless, right? The amount of, of, of spying that can be done on you is essentially endless with Pegasus. So at the end of the day, the best solution, in my opinion, is to, get, is to just get rid of it. So essentially, the whole point of this segment was to kind of tell you a little bit about NSO Group and Pegasus and about um, privacy rights and, and how a lot of our mobile data can get tracked back to us, even if we don't think it can, right? So we just need to be careful. Um, even if you're not a socialist and you're watching this, think really carefully about how you interact with your phone, how you interact with, you know, the world around you in terms of, of digital media and technology and stuff. If you're not comfortable putting something out there, don't do it. If you're not comfortable, uh, if you're not, if you're worried about what your phone might track you doing while you're doing something, leave your phone home, right? There are ways to get around this, but it becomes increasingly difficult because the ways that we can be surveilled are also evolving. So we have to think about this in a kind of a cost-benefit analysis thing, uh, a cost-benefit analysis framework where we think about, is it worth having our phone for this particular activity given what can possibly be tracked about us, right? And for most of the things that we do on a daily basis, it's not gonna matter, right? But now that you know that this is something that can be done to you, just be vigilant. Um, I wish I had a better way to cap this segment other than just, hey, you know, be vigilant and be careful. But the truth is, while software like this exists, and there are people who are trying to develop more powerful versions of this software, we just have to be careful until we can pass laws to make this type of processing illegal, um, both by corporations, but also by governments. Because the truth is, one of the things that was scary about this revelation about NSO Group was that governments were using it to spy on, e on each other and themselves, and even other people within their own government. So obviously, this is bananas. We need to make sure that something like this doesn't exist. We need to make sure that something like this cannot exist in the future because we do not want to live in a dystopian nightmare where everything we do is monitored and everything we do can be held against us at any given time, regardless of how private or out of context that act is construed. All right, so I want to now move to the climate change portion of our weekly programming. And I want to first talk about the most recent IPCC report and about COP26. So I'm very late to the, the ball game on the IPCC report. Um, for those who don't know, IPCC stands for Intergovernment, 
sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And essentially, this is a large board of scientists who is you who are using data coming in from a variety of observatories throughout the country and the world to make predictions about climate change. And they put out reports periodically about how we're doing in fighting the climate crisis. Spoiler alert, it's bad. And in fact, the last, the most recent IPCC report that came out said that instead of having, so originally it was thought that we had until 2030, which is nine years away, or 2050, which is 29 years away. It turns out that in order to reverse catastrophic climate change, we had at the time the report came out, which is three months ago now, I think, or two months ago, let's say two, about 17 months to start making major revisions. So obviously the problem is we now have about 15 months left and we definitely haven't done anything. So part of this process to move forward involves a conference called COP26. 26, I believe is just the 26th iteration. Um, and I don't remember what COP stands for, but it has to do with climate. And essentially we have to, as a world, start to make real progress on climate change or else we are going to be fought. And so this conference, this COP26, I believe it's happening in Scotland this year, uh, very shortly, is to essentially for the world together and to come to an agreement about what can be done about climate change. So in anticipation of this conference, there has been a pre-conference and at this conference, a friend of the show, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, Thunberg sorry, uh, has been speaking, I would say at, not really to, uh, world politicians, as well as lots of other youth climate activists who are essentially reminding our politicians, but in a sterner way, that we are running out of time. And it is going to eventually get to the point where it is too late where the prioritization of the profits of a select group of individuals is going to create a situation where life on this planet is no longer sustainable. So obviously we need this, these voices to not fall on deaf ears, but unfortunately it seems like for the most part, they are falling on deaf ears. So regardless of how scathing the criticisms are, and by the way, Greta had a great speech where she essentially said, you know, all of your plans, blah, 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 right? We've had blah, blah, blah for 30 years. And it's essentially, it's pretty words that mean nothing. And she has a point because the truth is, regardless of what you call your climate plan, we are not, we have not been moving in that direction. And actually a new report came out about which can countries are actually keeping pace with their climate promises for the Paris Accords. Now, just as a reminder, the Paris Climate Accords were not nearly enough. And in fact, when they were passed in, I think, 2017, Nicaragua specifically did not come on board. And that seems strange, right? But they said, this doesn't go far enough. We cannot sign into this. Now, eventually they changed their tune. And now the only country that has not officially, that had not signed into the Paris Climate Accords was the United States. I believe as a technicality, we are back in now, but not in any you know meaningful way. And so this report came out to show, hey, how we're doing. It's essentially a report card for how is the world doing in tackling climate change? And um, spoiler alert, it's also very bad because there is only one nation out of the over 200 nations that are signatories to the Paris Accord who are actually keeping pace with their climate obligations. You want to guess what country that is? I'll wait. Um, no, it's the Gambia. The Gambia is the only nation on this whole blue ball in space that is keeping up with their climate promises. And by the way, part of that is because the Gambia generates almost no pollution whatsoever. And by the way, most of these countries, and I'm going to talk about this in my next segment, most of the countries who are suffering right now from climate change do not actually produce that much green, that many greenhouse emissions. So obviously, this is a problem that is 
although the, the deleterious effects of climate change will affect smaller, poorer nations first, larger, richer nations are the primary ones driving the move towards, um, towards a catastrophic climate situation. And this is really unfortunate because in a lot of these countries that are richer, that are producing a lot of the fossil fuels and carbon emissions, many of the corporations that are primarily responsible for this are actually the ones who are benefiting the most from all of this, right? They are, uh, the, these corporations who benefit from this don't want to lose out on those profits because we're a capitalist system where profits rule everything. So they have commodified elections. They've taken over governments where they've needed to, um, either through campaign contributions, bribes, or through other means like, you know, influence peddling and, and such things and sponsorships and the like, or just straight out bribery, where profits have been allowed to stop climate policy from going into effect. Also, it's important to remember that in most countries, the climate pol in most rich countries, the climate policies that have been proposed have been pretty weak and don't even come close to the Paris Accords, which, as I mentioned earlier, don't go far enough to protect us against an inevitably uh, rapidly warming climate. And the truth is, that's not really that surprising. The other thing that I want to point out here is that, and, and I feel this is important to remind ourselves of whenever we're talking about climate change, is that we're not killing the Earth. The Earth, as a planet, is going to be fine without us, and did just fine when there was no life on it whatsoever. What we are doing is killing ourselves. And there is a great sculpture, and I forget where it is, but it's essentially, it's it's stone carved onto a brick. And this it's this brick is, is laid a little low under the rest of the pavement, so it floods routinely, even when it rains or there's a little puddle or whatever. And it's called... Uh, politicians arguing about climate change. And when the puddle fills, you can see that the politicians are drowning, but still debating it, right? And the message there, of course, is that regardless of what happens with anything else that we're doing, politicians are going to keep arguing over this because they're, they are not incentivized to actually move us forward in a direction that will save us. It's not about saving the planet. It's about saving us. We are on the chopping block because eventually this world will become too hot for us to inhabit. And it might be within my lifetime, which is terrifying. I cannot possibly imagine what it is going to be like. But, you know, I, I'm still worried about it. And obviously, I live in a richer country. I have some luxuries that many people on Earth do not have, which is, you know, I may be able to move, my government may be able to have resources for me. If things get really bad, and I, I like to bring up something that AOC said when she was talking about the Green New Deal. And I think this applies generally to all climate policy. The question is not, can we afford, uh, can we afford the climate policy, as expensive as it might seem on paper, but can we afford not to have climate policy? And the reason that she talks about this is because, in truth, regardless of what we do, regardless of the amount of money we spend on climate policy or don't spend on climate policy, what will inevitably end up happening is that when things go to shit, and by the way, they will, and they are doing now, um, quick pause, we are in climate change now. We're not, climate change is not some far off future event that we are eventually going to get to and don't have to think about. It's happening right now. And I'll talk about some examples shortly after this, but when things go to shit, someone will have to pay for it to, to pay for it, either to pay to fix bridges or to move people out of flooded areas or to save people from wildfires or to clean up after hurricanes or whatever else it is, or to, you know, to move people inland um, when sea levels eventually rise. And that's all going to cost money. But as the old saying goes, a pinch of prevention is worth a pound of cure, or a penny of prevention is worth a pound of cure, whichever way you like that particular, what's it called? You know what I mean. But the, the truth is, we're going to end up paying for climate catastrophe, whether we like it or not. So the 
question is, when do we start paying for it? Do we pay for it with lives, with blood and treasure? When people start dying, when wars start being fought over water, when people start to lose their homes because they're flooded or they can't farm anymore? Or do we start paying for it now to make sure that when climate change gets worse, and it will, that we have a robust defense and that we have taken steps to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change? If we do not do that, we will get to a, a situation where it becomes a fight of the fittest. And unfortunately, richer, whiter nations will win out just because they have the resources. We will essentially be participating as rich nations in the mass genocide of poor nations and countries. And if we do not start now making an effort to change the way that our economy and our world is set up, and by the way, that starts at COP26, that starts by taking the IPCC report seriously. If we don't do it now, we are going to have incredible, incredible amounts of blood on our hands later. And I, for one, don't think that's acceptable. I believe we need to start now. And I know many people agree with me, but we have to push those people in power to move away from their financial interests, move away from their uh, financial in incentives. And we need to make a concerted effort to remove corporate money from politics, not just in this country, but in all countries. Coal companies and oil companies and gas companies should not have more say, or any say, quite frankly, um, than regular people who are losing their homes, who are losing their livelihoods because of climate change. We don't get a choice about climate change happening. It's going to happen. But we do get a choice about how bad it gets. And the truth of the matter is, we can exercise some level of control about how bad it gets. So we need to do that. And we need to start now. Truthfully, we needed to start years ago, but we can't go back in time. What we need to do now is to make sure that at COP26, when we actually have in the room every world leader, everyone who can make a difference on this, that we actually start to make a difference. Because we're already seeing climate change. We had floods in China. We had floods in Germany. We had hurricanes in the US. We had flooding in the US. We had wildfires in the US and other places around the world. The most, the permafrost in Siberia is melting. The glaciers are melting. We're running out of time. And by the way, if you don't think this affects you, first of all, fuck you. And second of all, you're wrong. Italy right now is experiencing an incredible drought. And the crops that we love, like olives and grapes, are going to be affected by this. As we move forward, we have to remember that many of the foods that we eat, that we love, are tied very closely to the temperature of the locations in which they're grown. Grapes are not a particularly forgiving fruit. So for all you wine moms at home, and wine dads and wine anybody, if you like having wine, then climate change is important to you. If you like olive oil in your cooking, climate change is important to you. All of these things, it, fruits, vegetables, anything you can think of, anything that comes from the ground, essentially, those things grow because of the temperature, because of the soil, because of the way that the world is composed right now. So if we allow for climate change to change that in a fundamental way, we're going to see all the things that we love in life, as well as our families and loved ones and homes, be erased. The planet isn't dying. We are. And it's time we started to act like it. So as I mentioned in the previous segment, I want to talk a little bit about developing economies and climate change. And this is an issue I think I've actually touched on before. But it's important to remind everyone about this, especially as we get new context about reporting coming in from other countries. So 
what, first of all, let's talk about what a developing economy is. So a developing economy is typically an economy that does not have um, modern amenities. So think about things like universal running water or universal electricity um, relies on coal primarily for its power, where there is power. Um, and oftentimes these societies are mainly agrarian or agricultural societies with some information technology and manufacturing mixed in. But oftentimes, even those things are missing from developing economies. It depends. Developing economies covers a wide range of economies that deal with a variety of different countries experiencing lots of different things. And there's a huge scale. And also, developing economies doesn't refer to whole nation states. Sometimes within a country, you will have both developed and developing economies simultaneously. So you could say overall that India is a developing economy. However, there are large cities where they have most of the amenities that modern developed economies typically have. But on the other hand, there are also parts of that country where there are clearly not those types of resources. Okay, so I just want to give you a sense of what developing economy means and that it isn't a cat, it, you know, it, it's a catch all. So it, you know, it's not an exact measure by any stretch of the imagination. But generally speaking, you can think of these countries as typically being poor and without modern luxuries. Okay, but again, that's not a great definition either. Work with me here. Okay, so as the climate gets hotter, many of these nations are going to be affected. So Madagascar is an excellent example that has come up in the news recently, where despite the fact that the ocean is rising and that there's lots of salt water, it hasn't rained there in years. So it hasn't rained significantly, I should say, there in years. So Madagascar is primarily an agrarian economy, which means they need water for to grow their plants or else they can't eat. So mass starvation is setting in because Madagascar can't get the rainwater to produce crops so that individuals can live. Now, Madagascar did not create the climate crisis. They don't have great big coal factories that are pumping out, um, you know, massive amounts of carbon dioxide. They're not pumping CS CFCs into the air to put holes in the ozone, right? Madagascar is just trying to do its own thing. It's trying to get by, but it's being hit by climate change in two different ways. The first way, of course, is the ocean levels are rising. So people are having to abandon their homes because Madagascar is being swallowed by the ocean. And the second way is, while all that water is coming into Madagascar, none of it's usable for arable land. You can't really farm with salt water, and you definitely can't drink it. Not without significant processing, which, by the way, developing economies don't typically have. And by the way, most developed economies, just to be clear, do not have um, large scale measures for de for ocean desalination. So this is something that is like very important for us to think about in the developed world as well. So people are starting to starve and to move closer and closer together. By the way, the other thing that climate change makes more possible is pandemics. We're currently in a global pandemic. And for a place like Madagascar, where people are having to move closer together because of the lack of resources, well, people moving closer together who did not previously live together is a great way for pandemics to spread. And so we have to think about all the different contexts in which climate change will change our world. Now, of course, Madagascar is just one example. But in many countries throughout the world who are trying to catch up to the developed world, they're experiencing a variety of problems. And I want to take some time to talk about those. So there is lots of pressure from the developed world on the developing world to develop. And not only is this unfair, because the developed world has primarily imposed the conditions of developingness on the developing world, um, either through colonization or slavery or the mass removal of manpower um, or, other, or some other type of servitude. But when these nations do start to modernize, the easiest thing, the easiest ways for them to, to modernize are through the use of fossil fuels because those can be extracted. They don't require 
uh, very expensive um, parts like silicone for solar panels or the types of engines you need for wind turbines and, and geothermal and different turbines you need for um, tidal power or hydropower or geothermal power or what have you, right? So the easiest and cheapest way for them to develop is by using fossil fuels, which of course contributes to the climate crisis. But then now, because we're in a climate crisis, the world turns to these developing nations and says, oh, well, you should use more green energy. Well, obviously that's not fair because they are essentially just arriving to a stage of um, modernization that has existed in many of the developed countries for decades, if not centuries. But this pressure is being continued to be imposed on them because we are in crisis mode. So there is a way to get around this, of course, which is to actually force the richer countries who are producing more carbon dioxide to totally switch off to go carbon negative in their production of electricity and power and, and whatnot and to allow those developing countries to develop the traditional way, but to assist them in moving quickly from carbon emitting resources of power to non-carbon emitting resources of power. But that will take a concerted effort, right? And of course, because many of these rich countries, developed countries are actually profiting from sending their um, dirty fuel over to um, these slowly developing countries, there is an incentive to not move them off of that path, but at the same time to use pedantic rhetoric to make them feel as if that they are contribute to, contributing to a crisis for which is affecting them the most and for which they have contributed the least. So that's an additional pressure that they are feeling. And as we continue to go through this cycle, it's important to remember that if you look at, if you compare any developed and any developing country, and I mean in a situation where the whole country is more or less developed and the whole country is more or less developing, oftentimes there's an incredible power dynamic there, which has allowed for the developing, the, the developed country to either use the resources or manpower of the developing country to accelerate its development. It's hard to say, looking back at it, whether we would be in the situation we are in today, technology-wise, if there hadn't been a large-scale uh, theft of resources and manpower from Africa to um, what became the United States and Europe. But that amount of manpower and allowed for those nations, and by the way, the, the theft of natural resources as well, allowed for those nations to get a head start on those nations that we intentionally left behind, that we either subjugated later or colonized or, or what have you. So it's hard to say if, if we hadn't done that, if we'd have as much technology as we have now, but the truth is it doesn't really matter because we can't go back and fix it. But even if it did mean that we had fewer technologies today, it would make more sense for the world to have grown up industrially together because although it would have meant more carbon, more of a carbon footprint earlier, it also would have meant that as, as new technologies for reducing carbon emissions came out, they would be more equally spread out through the world and we could more quickly deal with the climate crisis. Additionally, it would also mean that we did not, we don't have to worry as much about acting as a collective unit. Now, of course, we should always act collectively for large scale crises. But if each country had the resources and was developing more or less at the same technological time scale, then you could use essentially selfish measures to make sure that you developed at either the same pace or at a faster pace than your neighbor, because everyone was developing more or less the same way. There wasn't, there wouldn't have been a large theft of resources um, and manpower over the course of centuries. <clears throat> Obviously, we can't fix that. But we also cannot take the stance that those countries that are developing, that are desperately just trying to get to the level of technology that we had 100 years ago, we cannot blame them for the climate crisis. Because doing so is disingenuous, and it's unfair.
in, we in the rich nations are the ones that have contributed the most to climate change. And to hold developing nations accountable for our mistakes, our sins, something that we can fix if we really want to, is just wrong. So as we continue to ponder solutions to climate change, we have to remember that this has to be driven by rich countries. This cannot be driven by developing countries. As I mentioned in the last segment, the only country presently that is keeping on target for their Paris, goal, their Paris Climate Accord goals is the Gambia. The Gambia has not contributed almost anything to climate change, which is partially probably why it is easier for them to keep to their climate targets. At the same time, rich nations who produce the vast majority of carbon emissions need to fundamentally shift what they're doing to go carbon neutral or carbon negative so that we we give developing nations the industrial and carbon allowance room that they need to develop the more modern technologies. And by the way, now that we have all these resources that we, by the way, more or less got from them or are benefiting from resources we got from these developing nations, it is now our responsibility, our right to help these developing nations develop and to push them through the, the narrow funnel of fossil fuels as soon as possible to make sure that if they do have to use fossil fuels, that they do so for a small amount of time and that we give them the resources to industrialize and to modernize like we did, but in a much smaller timescale. In truth, and just to kind of cap off these two climate change stories, we're running out of time. We don't have much of a choice any longer. We have to take fundamental action. How we do that, I hope I've outlined on this show enough times. But playing the blame game and pussyfooting around the answer is not going to cut it. Humanity's existence and the existence of many of the species that we know and love is on the brink. This planet will be fine without us. But we will not be fine without this planet. We have to do our part to make sure that we allow for everyone to get climate justice. Climate justice cannot just be reserved for the rich nations, because then it's not justice at all. It's climate supremacy, and it's just as bad as anything that you can think of that is any other type of supremacy. It means genocide. It means war. It means death. And if you're not okay with that, then we need to push a lot harder to change our world and to change it soon. All right, so we are gonna take a quick break from politics to take our dough out. Ta-da, it has risen beautifully. We are gonna go back to politics, mind you, but we what we need to do first is we need to divide our bread up and we need to allow it we need to allow it to start the rising process, okay? All right, so we are going to, oh, there we go. We are gonna divide this in half. We're gonna do that by weight. Um, but first, what we're going to do is we're going to give it a quick knead to make sure that all the oil gets incorporated. So we're just going to just give it a quick knead so it comes back together. There we go. This dough feels great. I'm so excited to eat this eventually. All right. So we're going to see how much it weighs. And then we're going to divide it. Come on, fit on the scale. You know you want to. Oop. Um, so it's about five pounds. All right. So we're going to try and divide this roughly in two. 
I'm just using my bench scraper. You can use a knife. All right. So let's see how much this weighs. Let's just give it a quick shaping. 2.6, okay. Let's see how much this weighs. Probably gonna weigh a little less. It kind of feels like it's gonna weigh a little less. 2.39, okay. So um, what I'm gonna do is gonna take a little bit off of here. So I just need it to weigh um, one ounce. That's gonna do it, okay. So I just need this in, give it a quick turn. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna transform these into um, to balls. But then we are going to pinch them together. Uh, sorry, we're going to, yeah, we're just gonna put these together on the table. So these are gonna sit for another 10 minutes. Um, and they're, we're gonna allow them to rise just another 10 minutes before we press them down and shape them. Just a quick little rise here. And we're just gonna cover them up put them on the table together here. And we will go back to politics for 10 minutes, okay? So set your timers for 10 minutes and we will be right back to bread. So, <clears throat> excuse me, the last issue I wanna talk about today that hopefully will take up our entirety of our 10 minutes is I want to talk about the end of the war in Afghanistan. So I know we've talked a lot about this, but it's important for me to bring this particular story to your attention because it unveils a lot of things about our politics. So as many of you know, the U.S. ended its war in Afghanistan um, at the end of August. The goal was to have everything done by September 11th, and lo and behold, we actually did hold to that, which is... Um, an absolute miracle, if you ask me. But we did do it, and um, as many of you also know, it was a bit of a rocky end to our 20-year uh, vacation in Afghanistan. Obviously, I'm joking. It was not a vacation. It was terrible and brutal and horrible. But we got out, right? War's over. Yippee skippy. Can go back to regular not being at war. Two things on that. First of all, the United States is still at war, actually, just not in Afghanistan. So we have troops in Iraq, we are bombing Somalia, uh, Yemen, Pakistan, um, we are, have troops in Niger. So we are still um, a burgeoning empire, unfortunately. So, but we did bring back a bunch of troops and a bunch of resources. So in theory, we don't need as much money any longer to fight wars, right? Or so you'd think. However, recently, the United States Congress passed a, um, a budget bill for the military. And for anyone who was paying attention, the thought might have gone like this. Well, we're fighting fewer wars now, so we don't need as much money. Therefore, we should reduce the amount of money that we are spending on the military to make way for other projects that we can do at home or just to save some money because we don't need it anymore, right? Makes sense. Perfectly logical argument. Unfortunately, that's not how things went. In fact, the military budget increased after the troops in Afghanistan came home. Now, you might think to yourself, well, that doesn't make any sense. True, it doesn't. However, the problem is, if you're thinking that way, you don't know the American system very well. So the reason I say this, and I don't mean any offense, is because the American system especially when it comes to military spending, has actually an incredibly small amount to do with what's actually needed by the U.S. government and the U.S. military. It has more to do with how much profit can be given to quote-unquote defense contractors. I think warmongers is a perfectly good name for them, and I will be using it from now on. But these warmonger corporations, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, um, Raytheon, uh, and Boeing, just to name a few, make lots of money by selling the government things overpriced. And regardless of what the United States does with these items, 
we still shell out for them. But you see, the war in Afghanistan was fought primarily for, and they won't, no one will say this, but was fought primarily to increase the stock portfolios of those people who were invested in, in defense contractors. And if you look at the long-term stock prices of these companies, they went up. They outperformed the market by incredible amounts. Why? Because no matter what happened, win some, lose some, the war is popular, the war is unpopular. The United States continued to buy more stuff from these contract, uh, from these uh, warmonger corporations because we have added a profit motive to war, which is an incredibly bad thing for a whole host of reasons, most of which you can probably imagine without me saying anything. But the most important of which is as soon as we introduce a profit motive into war, in a capitalist system where profits have to continue to increase, there has to be constant war, or there has to at least be constant war spending. And for the more money we spend, and the more of these resources we create, they have to go somewhere. So what ends up happening is either the United States sells these resources or gives these resources away to organizations that quite frankly shouldn't have them. So we spent uh, we spend lots of money on these war machines to pay off these warmonger corporations, and they go to places like Israel or Egypt, who have incredibly poor human rights records, or Saudi Arabia. Don't even get me started on how bad theirs is. Um, or we give them to U.S. police departments, and I would say that the human rights record of police departments might actually be worse than that of Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt combined. Okay, which is why, by the way, in the United States, when you saw the Ferguson protests and things and the Dapple protests and pretty much every major protest, the police has tanks and military gear and they're dressed up like they're in Kandahar because the truth is that's where they got that stuff from there. It's called the 1033 program. It is a program in which military equipment and hardware is given to police departments. But anyway, I think I did a segment on that, so I'm going to push it to the side. To get back to the point at hand, the point of U.S. spending on military equipment has never been and is never going to be the actual fighting of wars efficiently and in a manner that actually protects the United States. The biggest mistake we could have possibly made was not heeding the warning of President Eisenhower, who warned us of the military-industrial complex and essentially, although not directly, warned us of the problems of having a profit motive inside the inside the war machine because inevitably there will always be pressure on politicians who pay bribes campaign contributions nominally to get the military budget to increase over and over and over again so that the people who hold all the power in these warmongering corporations can continue to make money quarter after quarter and year after year, and in this case, decade after decade. The military industrial complex is so deep within our zeitgeist, our political zeitgeist, there are jobs related to warmongering in every single state in the union. So it is easy for a corporation to say, well, if you cut the military budget, you'll be losing jobs in your state. And then once they do that, and if the politician is still brave enough to cut the military budget, then ads will run against them saying they cut good jobs in your state. And look, oftentimes these jobs do pay well. They pay engineers. They're making lots of money. And honestly, we need engineers, but we don't need them for that. In fact, um, a friend of mine who's more or less like family is an engineer himself, and he was looking for jobs. He wanted to do something in the civil sphere, but literally could not find anything and ended up working at a warmongering corporation. Now, he himself doesn't like war. He doesn't like the idea of U.S. imperialism or invading other countries, more or less for sport. But the truth is, we have funneled an incredible amount on, uh, we, have, we have funneled an incredible amount of resources into the, uh, into the military industrial complex that we don't even use our good engineers for non-military uses any longer, for the most part. So for people who went to engineering school and paid all this money to be engineers, they end up in a situation where they have to work for a warmonger. 
because that's how ingrained this all is. Which hopefully explains why, no matter what happens, no matter how many wars we stop fighting, no matter how many troops we bring home, no matter how many people we evacuate from other countries and bring into the U.S., the defense budget, the defense budget, goodness gracious, even that is propaganda, but the military budget of the United States is never going to decrease. It's never going to go down because we stopped fighting somewhere. There will always be another excuse. There will always be either another war or another engagement or another something that the military industrial complex and the warmonger corporations and politicians that make it up will find a way to reward the whole, the, the stockholders of these warmonger corporations because it was never about defense. It was never about the American people. It was never about America. It always was about making more money for the people at the top of these corporations who are invested in war as their business model. And they have to sell that to someone. And unfortunately, the US government just happens to be the most willing and perhaps the most gullible buyer. Okay. That's our second timer. That was our 10 minutes. So we're going to look at these guys. And lo and behold, they have grown. So we're going to take our plastic off. And now we're going to put these. Now it says to put them on sheet trays. So you, if you are making these without tins, then that's what you should do. I'm making these in tins. Um, and this is just your standard nine by five um, by three tin. So I'm going to take each of these very carefully and just plop them in a tin, just move them around a little bit. And remember at this stage, you don't really wanna do a ton of touching of them because essentially what's gonna happen is, so first of all, these are gonna fill out these containers, but also what's gonna happen is if you fiddle with them a bunch, they are going to deflate. And if they deflate, then you won't get those beautiful air pockets that we love to have in bread. So, I am gonna set these to start rising. Um, you wanna set these for at least an hour. Um, yeah, let's see. Okay, so you wanna let these rest till double in size uh, or at least one hour. So I'm gonna set a timer for an hour right now and then I will give you some instructions about what we're gonna do with these once they have risen for another hour, okay? So, uh, by the way, you want to keep you want to keep letting these rise until they are double in size. Don't rush the process. Don't it, it doesn't have to be exactly an hour, right? Bread takes time. It will take as much time as it needs. We were careful to make sure the bread was at the right temperature before we started rising it, so it will continue to rise. Don't worry about that. It'll fill out our tins. It'll make nice, big, beautiful loaves, um, and I'm looking forward to having those. Okay, so once you have, once they have risen to the level that you are comfortable with them rising with, and by the way, just check them every half hour, right? They do seem to grow pretty quickly. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot to do one thing. Sorry. Sorry, I forgot one part of the instruction. I forgot one part of the instruction. Um, you do need to push them down a little. That's what they said to do. Sorry. It says to push it down a little. I forgot about that. We're gonna do this again. Okay, take two, timer's on. I'm gonna reset the timer to an hour. I'm gonna move these over here so they can rise again. Okay, oops. All right, so now a timer, now an hour timer is set. Um, so what happens after that? We are gonna set our oven to 400 degrees, okay? And we are gonna put these loaves in the oven and let them, Bake for 35 to 45 minutes or until golden brown. If you have a thermometer, remember you want your bread to be about 205 degrees, anywhere between 200 and 210 is just fine. And if you don't have a thermometer, just make sure that when you give it a nice little knock, it sounds hollow on the inside. All right, we wanna make sure we don't have any raw dough. And this should be an absolutely incredible 
bread. One quick note though that Stephen has asked me to give. This bread only should is is doesn't freeze particularly well. So you just want to make sure that you have enough time to eat it. Um, you know, put it in a Ziploc bag if you don't think you're going to eat it right away. That's probably going to help keep it shelf life for as long as possible. But anyway, this should be a delicious and wonderful bread that you can use uh, for toast and sandwiches and should be really nice. Also, apparently you can use this recipe for rolls. I did not demonstrate how to do that, but essentially what you would do is you would take, so instead of dividing into two loaves, what you would do is you would divide it into as many rolls as you want, just weighing them to make sure that it's even. You obviously divide by two, then divide that by two, and then that by two, and just go until you have rolls that you want to have in size. Give you beautiful potato rolls, and you can either cook these flat on a sheet tray, um, or you can cook them in you know, any other container that you think makes sense for rolls. But essentially, that is it for this week's show. We will be back next week. Um, I cannot wait to make more bread with you. And I look forward to seeing the picture of your loaf, of your potato loaves that you make this week. All right, everybody, take care. Have a great week.